So no sooner than we were in Denver, finally, did we start immediately exploring all of the outskirts around Denver. Eric had this wanderlust. I mean, he was an airplane pilot and he liked to go places. And so I was starting to feel a little bit uh, disorientated by in my relationship with Eric as opposed to Eric being a stabilizing force, which, which he was to some extent when I was beyond crazy in Miami doing cocaine and, and partying all night. Now we're, we're in Denver and one of the first things we do is that we go camping in this place called uh, Georgia Pass. And we go up there to look at the stars. It's 11,585 feet, something like that. And we go up to look at the stars and go camping. And while we're doing that, I have a vision. I've never like had visions before. Uh, and I am laying in the tent with Eric. He's asleep. And what is my vision of? But my visions of James Dean. James Dean comes from above. Seriously, I mean, I seriously, I seriously saw this, like, freaked me the fuck out because there was James Dean and he comes in and I sense, I feel like he's saying to me that he wanted my soul. That he wanted my soul. So I thought to myself for a second, do I want my soul? Do I want my soul or do what I, you know, James Dean is hot certainly and famous, was famous or should I merge? What does this mean? <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, no, I said, no, I want to keep my soul. And, and I woke up, you know, it. I woke up the next day. I don't think I've ever told Eric about that. Uh, I just don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I was drinking a little bit when we went up there, but not as much as usual because Eric was, was hateful of my drinking too much. And so I had to sneak it or I had to do it on occasions where we went out somewhere or there was a party. But anyhow, long story short is there's James Dean and he comes floating down and I don't know what to make of it, but this will set the stage for the rest of this experience, this early Denver experience. We're talking now in the last part of 1996, which we're approaching now the end of the millennium. And weird stuff is going on in all sorts of areas because people are afraid of the end of the millennium. And there's a lot of weird energy in the, in the, in moving into the late 90s. So the next thing, no sooner does that, all of that happen that I have my two friends, Marie and Beatrice, come out and visit me and Eric from France. And the French people, the Europeans, right, they get August off, they get August off. So they all, en masse, go on vacation in August. Everywhere, everybody, everybody goes, they all go on vacation and they take weeks off, you know which I was always jealous of because I only had two weeks vacation. You know, that's the American, that's what you get if you're lucky, you know, to get paid vacation time. So they showed up and uh, we were had three weeks again to show them everything around Denver. And Eric was all for it. I tell Eric, you know, listen, I don't have any money to do too much extravagant stuff with these girls. And he, you know, agrees to pay for it. Well, he kept receipts for it and, you know, he was gonna charge me for it later. But they show up and we go everywhere. We take them to Boulder. We, you know, of course, show them just Denver for one day because this is a fast, fast trip, right? We go to Monument Valley and we go up to Aspen again. We drive, we're driving everywhere. We drive to Moab, Utah. We drive through to Monument Valley, you know, and we, we 
with those picturesque, iconic scenes in the background. And you know, trips like this are, there, it was hard for me to remember the experience there other than I had to look at some pictures because when, when, it's, when, when things are moving so quickly in a trip and a lot of the trip became nothing more than a stage set for numerous pictures that Marie took of, of us all, but mostly of Beatrice. Now remember, Marie and Beatrice are the two women who I stayed with in Paris last before I moved out of Paris to Athens. They are, um, Beatrice is from an old aristocratic wealthy family and Marie worked in healthcare. They're um, what at the time was called lipstick lesbians. And that means that they were uh, very formally feminine in appearance and dress and in the way they presented themselves in public. And so for instance, Beatrice comes to go, and Beatrice is always posing very regally in every picture and she has pearls. She wore pearls for this, this hiking. Sometimes we didn't really hike. We just stopped at viewpoints often. And sometimes we stayed in hotels. But our camping, our camping was with like this fold out picnic table that we got. And we'd sometimes have foie gras. We'd eat, you know, drink wine. Uh, Beatrice came from a family that they went hunting. And so she would have this whole outfit to go with whatever. And it was, I wasn't very connected to nature at the time. Thank God I am much more so now because I have a, I make a conscious effort to be connected, you know, to feel what's going on more so than just as a photo shoot setting. Although as you see, I'm still doing that. But I also have a deeper sense of what, what it feels like to be here. And I do talk to it. I talk to the trees and I talk to the animals and I interact with the insects even in some way. So I, but back then I was, I brought a bunch of pot and I, and they all, everybody smoked it a little bit and they thought it was kind of cool. And I just was obtuse as far as what was really going on. I was annoyed by all the other tourists and I would project what I thought they were thinking about all the other tourists, the American tourists, into my own mind. Because Beatrice, didn't speak almost any English. So everybody was speaking in French, but me, which I barely understood French. And I was concerned that Eric, and I know he did, was to talk, um, well, talk a lot of shit about me, and rightfully so, in many ways, because living with an alcoholic was not an easy thing to do. And we loved each other very much. He loved me, but he, he was at wit's end as to what, how to manage it, how to manage me. He tried to manage me, which was a mistake, because you can't really, uh, by always getting angry at me when I drank too much, when I had my binges. And, but otherwise he was just very frustrated and he'd have some other frustrations too. And this all started to peak about the end of the trip. So here, I'm not really connected to nature. Marie's taking pictures like crazy. Beatrice is posing with her, with her um, pearls on, with Monument Valley behind us. We traveled to New Mexico. Again, the photo scenes and the adobe brick, you know, kind of native thing where I believe I kind of picked up a native uh, spirit, but more on that, maybe some other time. And uh, then we, definitely I did. And then we ended up um, going to Vegas. So Vegas is of course the most 
fake of every everything, right? But but there's no charade about the fakeness, right? It's they're real about the charade. They're making uh they're making the charade the reality and being fully conscious of the charade. And there's something there's some nuance to that that's kind of honest, you know? And very American, very fucking American, right? Here I am projecting how Europeans, because my grandmother and mother, my grandmother, not my mother, was very critical of Americans. She was an aristocratic Russian who lost everything in the revolution, the Russian revolution. And I was raised with this attitude of superiority, aristocratic superiority, which is what Beatrice probably picked up on. And I've, of course, told them all the stories of my aristocratic heritage. And Eric picked up on, and Marie picked up on, and Eric is nouveau riche. But he has a southern French accent, so he was never, you know, fully accepted into Parisian society or any of that. So it was me that was introducing Eric to uh, these highfalutin Parisian upper crust gay they're lesbian but in the closet still society and he he dug it he ate that up but it was me who actually sees so much of the charade and all of that I never never I don't get into the pretense and I don't get into the whole idea of there being like aristocratics or rich people, like I said, are, are any better whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I, I have a lot of judgment towards those attitudes for sure. And I don't buy into it at all, just at all. So I'm, I'm you know, Eric is, you know, frock raw and we're having the beats. We're, you know, you know, posing and now we're in Vegas and I am, I am not acting as my best person. Let's just put it that way, anyhow. And I was starved for my alcohol because it's three weeks we were on the road with just drinking like a little bit, a bottle of wine between the four of us. And you know, that wasn't enough for me. I'm a binge alcoholic. We get to Vegas and I'm gambling. We spent two nights there. Marie, like there's, a, I have a picture of her dressed in a blazer and pumps. She's got her heels on, girl. She's got her heels on. And I, I am, I, I'm just staying up late. They, they left me to my own devices in Vegas. And I went full out because they were giving free drinks to you if you sat at the gambling table back then in 1996. And so I just went full out and partied my ass off. I drank, I smoked cigarettes. You could smoke then openly and gambled, made money one night, lost money the next. And Eric on the ride home was furious. Apparently, and I blacked this out, but we had a physical fight in the car. And by the time we got home, it was pretty much, and this was uh, August of 1996, a uh, year after we met, it was the beginning of a form of horribly tortuous end. You know, he started to move out and he was outraged not only but by my behavior but which he had every right to be but also he was undergoing immense stress because eric's visa for him to even be in the united states for us to be together was expired or expiring at some point he would go over the amount of time he was legally allowed in this country on his visa, which is a serious no-no. Yeah, he was he was he was not allowed to come back to America for five years, and he loved America. He had he grew up with a flag, an American flag, over his bed, and he had all these visions and these dreams of how much he much he loved. He truly loved this country. So he wasn't a snob in that respect. But he was not able to stay here. And we even tried to get him married to a friend of mine. And the lawyers, he went to two lawyers, said, no, that's not gonna work. 
And then we got to, we tried to, another friend of mine suggested that he adopt him. And that wouldn't work either. You needed to be under 16. But this older friend of mine who made that suggestion came from, and I started to meet finally these older gay guys. And he came up with the suggestion that, well, in the, back in the day, that's what gays did, is you had to adopt. <laughs> gay marriage was far, gonna be far, far away from this time period. 96, you know, gay marriage didn't come into reality until 2014, I think. And uh, so we were, we were screwed. We knew that we couldn't have a relationship because he was not uh, legal and because he, we couldn't get married. So he had that stress to deal with, which was horrifying. If travel that we had decided to do together was delusional um, for many reasons, one of which was Eric really thought that he wanted to just he'd be a pilot. It would allow him to fly and had no clue whatsoever how to manage an entrepreneurial business. And working out of the house, supposedly, we had a phone, we had phone numbers and put flyers up for people to contact us about this tour operating company that we were starting. You'd have to sit by the phone to answer it. We didn't have cell phones, so neither one of us were suited for that either. So that died. But what, what started to happen for me was a lot. I started to oddly get very grounded by doing a film called Asteroids. I got grounded by the asteroids. My agency set me up with a film called Asteroid. And back in the 90s and even before that, like asteroids and meteors, we were all freaked out about that, right? It's kind of armageddon -y, right? It's kind of end of millennial -y, right? And um, there were quite a few movies about that, and this was a big one. It was called Asteroid, and it came out in 1997, and it starred an uh, actor called Michael Biehn. And I did some extra work and got elevated. At first, I was like a FEMA person, and so I'm moving into this acting kind of, pseudo-acting kind of atmosphere. And well, de definitely the acting atmosphere. Because I... And that, that, that fit perfect because that's where models, you know, tried their feet in, right? They try to move into and to that area. And the agency was smart to give me this and it was very exciting to do it. So I, I'm in here and I, I actually ended up being a standby for Michael Bean. So they, they put makeup on me and they make me look like him and they, they set up the cam, you know, they, it's how they set the cameras and, it, and whatnot. And I work like 14 hour days for this and end up meeting a friend of mine, Karen, at the time. I've lost track of her now. And Karen was a stunt woman, she's a really cool um, woman. And, but she's also a ghost buster. Yeah, she was like, Karen was like, Karen and her husband, Jose, uh, who I just found out passed away, um, were like this epicenter of all this supernatural stuff going on in Denver. Supernatural now, okay? Now, mind you, I'm still going to church. I'm going to Methodist churches, and I'm taking a wreath there. I still am openly come out as a Christian. I'm a Christian, right? I say, I think this is my uh, concept of things, but I'm totally... You know, Christians have a lot of supernatural, obviously, content in their belief structure. So uh, it's not, it wasn't such a far leap for me to um, just be there. I was right there. I was like, okay. And my, my mother and grandmother being Russian, there is a lot of uh, ghost story, so to speak. There's a lot of Russian ancient old Russian folklore and attitudes and relationships with the supernatural. So I end up 
uh, hanging out with Karen then after Asteroids and we end up going to a uh, ghost busting. I go ghost busting with her. Because Denver is full of haunted, creepy, and not creepy places. Denver is seriously, seriously has some stuff going on. And I learn a lot. I learn a lot. Like through Karen, I learned that like a huge percentage of people have experienced, although I never had, other than I, the super initial, you know, the vision of James Dean, you know, I didn't picture as a ghost, but I guess he was, maybe. Mm. Anyhow, Karen, uh, there's a huge percentage of people who see ghosts or experience ghosts who are afraid to, to talk about it because they don't want to appear crazy. And we went to a bar, I remember a bar that, of course, you start talking to about, you know, what you do. Like, we were talking to the bartender and other people that we had just come from a ghost hunting. Yeah, a ghost hunting. So we, we go to, she got access to these places and we would bring, she had all the cameras, she had all the whatever, heat monitors, she had all of that shit. And I went with her and we, we, we went there to feel and experience energies. We once brought our psychic friend and it was weird to say the least. It was pretty fucking weird. And um, we're sitting at a bar and we're talking to them and sure enough, he goes, well, look at, see, there's a stair, sure, there was a stairway that led to nowhere, to the ceiling. Because it was this old building that the bar, the second floor had been taken off. And he's, yeah, every so often I see a ghost go up there. The woman next to us says, yeah, I've seen a ghost. And like, just talking randomly was proving her statistics about how many people see ghosts. And I, I was really bought into it too. And still, you know, I didn't have a definition of that. But now I do have a better understanding of everything. But then after working on asteroids and ghost hunting with Karen, I ended up temping for of the film industry for the Screen Actors Guild, which was a perfect fit. I started temping because after the trip back, I realized I needed to get my shit together work-wise. You know, I didn't have money for this trip. I haven't had money for all year, practically. I had the ear surgery. I was fired by my job as a waiter in Miami Beach. And here we're in Denver, I'm hanging out with all of these people who have secure jobs, secure income, or sources of income, like Eric did through his family. And I have a group of friends that I'm communicating with now that I'm back in the States who are all working and making money and progressing in their lives because I'm 33 now. I'm going to be 33. It's, I'm 32. And I'm flipping around Everybody else I know is much more accomplished, but I'm searching through my soul and my whole being. How can I get this a job even? And I'm looking for jobs like crazy. And I'm not landing them. A friend helped me out to consider going to public relations. And I started doing volunteer work for that, for the human rights campaign also. But I'm getting unemployment and I'm feeling like shit. You know, I'm feeling bad. The modeling, like I said, never paid. And now I'm in Denver and it's not a huge modeling market, but I still have an agency. And so I start temping, which is great. It's a great thing to do. And the temp agency eventually hooked me up with something that really meets my interest is the Screen Actors Guild. So I'm filing and doing paperwork and they actually offered me a full-time position as a secretary. They were called secretaries back then. But I have a master's degree in business and I also have the elitism of having traveled around the world in a sense and I feel like I learned through either word of mouth or somehow that within that organization, once you're a secretary, you're always a secretary. They're always gonna look at you at that, no matter, no matter the fact that secretaries are so knowledgeable, that they run the ship, that they know what the hell they're doing. It's, maybe it's the time, I don't know how it is now, but that's the attitude. Like once you're a secretary, they don't promote you. 
And I knew that I'd need to be promoted. And the other thing that I needed was the fact that, like, I, I was concerned about going back to this American situation where you don't have any vacation time. You have, you get two weeks if you're lucky to start, and then you're done. You're done. You're, you get two weeks a year, and you're expected to work, work, work. And that, to me, never suited me. It drove me insane. I needed more time to be away from work, to be in my own spirit in my own soul, to be in my own consciousness and to have the freedom and the flexibility that I needed, you all probably know. So anyhow, the, good, the weird news and the good news was that I was getting kind of grounded. I got myself this, this temp work that lasted for three full weeks solid. I said no to the full-time job, did other temp work. Looking for a job full-time, full-time and doing some volunteer work, doing other, meeting all these people, hooking up with these older gays, which was the first time that I was interacting with these silent generation gays. I'll tell you more about them in the next video. And every was floundering. And we were having relationship problems. So, I would end up spending my 33rd birthday not with Eric, which was October 27th. I would spend it with my friend Karen and we would be making these dream catchers all day, which were really cool. I just found my dream catcher. And she was teaching me stuff. She taught me about numerology. She taught me about tarot. And shortly after that, um, it's funny because we go to a Halloween party together and I was feeling the loss of my relationship. This is my first big relationship since coming out or ever, you know, that was both sexual and emotional. And it was over, it was over, it was so ending. To make matters more complicated was Eric's mother came out for three months. She got her own place to stay and Eric spent more time with her than he did with me. And since August, he was not staying with me anyhow during the week, he was staying with friends and just we would see each other on the weekend. So she came out and, and he actually came out to her shortly before my birthday, on National Coming Out Day, which was very another stress of his. I mean, coming out to your parents was tough. And they both decided that he couldn't come out to his father. So, yeah, or ever, ever. So here he was either illegal or becoming illegal and just coming out to his mother and she was there. So you can imagine, she was a Catholic. And she was graceful to me. She said, I hope it works out with you and it, my son. But it, I don't know exactly all the stresses between him and her ever. Other than I think it never worked out. And I was still getting letters a year later from my mother. Letters that said, Hey, Robert, you're looking for a job, or she didn't write it that way, but she said, you know, looking for a job, just beware that the quote unquote gay thing isn't acceptable. Please note the enclosed article. Because you're not gonna be able to get a job with that gay thing. This is a year after this. So we're both only children enmeshed growing up with our mother, enmeshed. And here we have this kind of stressful situation. So I dressed as a black hole <laughs> for Halloween. I was a black hole. Asteroids were coming, I was an asteroid. Eric was an astronomer with the sky. I was surrounded with this darkness and ghosts had made an appearance. I was ghost hunting and Eric got into this with me a little bit 
and he we, he started having some weird ghost situations happening to him. We crazily went to the Stanley Hotel, which is Stephen King's inspiration to do The Shining. It was filmed here in Oregon. The outside was filmed at Timberline Lodge in Oregon, but apparently there's this room at the Stanley Hotel that was haunted and another room 237 was haunted and another room 217 that Stephen King uh, had a nightmare and that was the vision for The Shining. So we go there, Eric and I. I don't remember if Karen came to check it out because of course we're always still running around. We're the spinning, spinning. I don't know if you're you know, that kind of person or, or not. But I know a lot of people still who just, they're just, const you're constantly doing something, constantly, right? Never at home, traveling, 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 going, going, going. And for me, it was just equal art. You know, I couldn't, I'm trying to get grounded and try to get some money and temping, right? And doing volunteer work and doing all of this stuff. And I just taking off and doing these adventures and camping and going here and there and everywhere was totally destabilizing for me. And you know? I can't do it. And uh, so we're at the Stanley Hotel and I get five claw marks on my back. I got scar, I got like these weird psychic attack, a psychic attack, I guess. I don't understand what that is. I've never researched that. And, um, one day we're sitting at home in, in the apartment. Eric is visiting for the weekend and it, and we have sex when he comes for the weekend and make up kind of. And uh, this photograph that he had framed in glass on the wall just falls off and shatters on the floor, just in front of our eyes. And you know, these are all like kind of scary signs, really. I mean, Thanksgiving came and I felt so drained that I went to the hospital and took AIDS tests and everything and it, there was nothing wrong with me, but this other old, old gay friend of mine who would write books about channeling told me that, you know, it was my energy was being sucked off. My energy around Eric was being drained. I mean, this is what he tells me on Thanksgiving about the partner I love. So one last episode was that, you know, we went snowboarding and his car door is all of a sudden open. <laughs> I don't know. So snowboarding came back. I had started snowboarding when it was invented because I'd been skiing since I was four and or earlier three and um we went to my parents just held me between their legs i couldn't do anything so it was around that just that age and uh so i'm snowboarding so eric and i go snowboarding the first time we went was so wonderful i said that we were getting along i wrote in my journal later so well that i i cried but by the fourth time, it's now December, December, and Eric has, Eric is planning on going back to France. He's thinking he can just go back for a few months, work stuff out, and come back to the States. Totally stressed about this, which for good reason, turned out that he couldn't, that he'd screwed it up by staying too long, too long. So we go snowboarding and I snowboarding great. It's our fourth time and Eric still doesn't know whether or not he's goofy footed or straight normal footed. So he doesn't know what foot to put forward on the board. He's floundering and falling and stressful when you're as a couple and one person's doing really well in a sport and the other person's a mess. And he was so frustrated. People get so frustrated, you know, when you're not performing at a sport after you've done it four times. And he 
we go back to the car and there's these other snowboard dudes nearby getting high and I'm like, I shouldn't really do this. Eric's not gonna like this. But I want to, I just had fun snowboarding and why can't we have fun, you know? I'm always like, I was always opposed to um, formality or opposed to the society that was moving in a direction of more conservatism in the way that people behaved. Having been raised in the parents in the 60s and 70s, where society was much more free flowing, so to speak. You know, people were outlandish. The alcoholism was out of control. Um, pollute, people just threw their garbage everywhere. I mean, talk about the environment now. But there was also, there were the rules and the restrictions and the, the way that people kind of behaved socially, the social norms. You know, for instance, smoking started becoming illegal, right? And that was like not the case in this. So I was like, of, I was influenced still by an era in which I, and I read books about the roaring 20s, you know, and I was a drinker and I was into the martini culture. I was into that. I was into being uh, extrovert, eccentric, a person that broke the rules. I was into being James Dean. I was into being the rebel without a cause. There's no wonder that I would have seen James Dean. I was James Dean. I wanted to be James Dean. James Dean didn't need to take my soul because of course he was joking about that. <laughs> I already had the soul of James Dean who ended life early and it's a miracle that I survived to that point, right? So sure. I smoked the joint. I hung out with those guys. I smoked the joint and and got high. And Eric was waiting for me in the car. We, he wanted to go. He'd been frustrated. He's leaving for France and might not ever be able to come back. And I'm getting stoned and I'm having a good time. And I'm like having fun snowboarding and let's live for today, you know? Let's just live for today. And that was the end. He spat on my face. I don't mean to dish him because he doesn't have a voice in this at all. It's just part of the, the story here. Because that's what French people, I guess, of a certain era. Now we're talking of certain eras. And I'll talk more about that again. Like the olden days. Like way back. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And Eric was influenced by that too, but that's apparently what people, that's a French thing. You spit on a person's face if you're pissed at him. He spat on me and told me to get out of the car, tried to kick at me. And we're on a mountaintop driving home, about to drive home. And I didn't, of course, and I drove, but I, I drove then and got home and he moved out. He took whatever his possessions he wanted at that moment and the next possessions the next day. And uh, he, uh, he left. He, he, he went to stay with these friends, Dagley, who on the drive home, he told me he had slept with. So he broke what I thought was our monogamy as well. He had had sex with Dagley. But I mean, anybody named Dagley, I don't know who's a Dagley, but it, Kind of, it was funny in a sense. Because it was Dagley, really? Okay. God bless the situation and him. Because living with an alcoholic, no. So that was it. He ended up going back to France, never to return. And uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll cover more in the last and final episode of Modeling. Ciao.